Welcome. My name is Hubert Savanea and I'm a hydrologist. The most visible and most intriguing part of the hydrological cycle is the runoff. Every person has at some stage looked in fascination at flowing water or been inspired by the beauty of or the violence of a stream. Flowing water seems alive and it is an inseparable part of our life. Water has been essential to create and support our societies and sometimes it threatens it with its destructive force. As we saw earlier, it took philosophers and scientists some time before they realized that river runoff is completely dependent on precipitation. At first, they thought that there was not enough precipitation to feed the rivers. But in fact, there is a lot more than that. Globally, less than 40% of the precipitation leads to a runoff. As precipitated moisture travels through the terrestrial cycle, it is stepwise partitioned into other fluxes. The first partitioning point is the surface. If rain falls on water or on saturated land, then it runs off directly to the open water. We call this saturation excess overland flow. Above land, rainfall is intercepted by leaves, the litter on the ground and the ground itself, where it may pond. And from there, it evaporates back to the atmosphere. The typical time scale of this process is between an hour and a day. If the ponding is large enough, water may flow over land and find its way to, it, to the stream. We call that infiltration excess overland flow or Hortonian overland flow after the great American hydrologist Horton. This overland flow is very fast, with a time scale of hours. The remainder infiltrates into the soil, from where it can transpire or percolate into the groundwater during, <coughs> during, a, sorry, during a rainfall event the soil can become so saturated that pockets, of saturated that pockets of saturation occur under the ground at relatively shallow depth. If the terrain is sloped, then the subsurface pocket may connect and generate subsurface runoff through a network of preferential channels. These channels have been created by the water itself, making use of root channels, animal burrows and fissures. In mountainous and hilly areas, this is a dominant mechanism, which we call storage excess subsurface flow, or shortly interflow. The water that percolates to the groundwater subsequently feeds the very slow groundwater flow that sustains the base flow of the river. Finally, groundwater can be exchanged with neighboring areas or may rise to the unsaturated soil by capillary rise. The many storages and thresholds in this system are the reason why the rainfall runoff processes is highly non-linear. Although the individual processes can often very well be described by linear processes, just like we saw with the groundwater seepage. So the fast surface runoff is the precipitation, minus the interception and the infiltration. The fast subsurface runoff is the infiltration minus the transpiration, the soil evaporation and the percolation. And the base flow equals the percolation minus the capillary rise. It is hard to distinguish these different runoff components once the water has entered the river. But the water can reveal its origin when we look at the color and composition. If it is very turbid and flowing fast, then it stems from surface runoff. If it flows fast and is mostly clear, then it stems from rapid subsurface flow. If the water is clear and the flow is quiet, then it consists of seepage flow from the groundwater. From the chemical elements in the water, the isotope composition and the turbidity, we can deduct the origin of the water, but also the time it spent in the catchment before it came to runoff. 
But that goes beyond this introductory course. Depending on the climate and the physical properties of the landscapes in the catchment, rivers have different runoff signatures. Here we see clearly different signatures from two neighboring catchments. On average, the Rhine has about 10 times more discharge than the Meuse. Not only is the runoff of the Rhine larger, it is also less variable over the year. What makes these patterns so different? Is it climate? No, it's the landscape. The climate is not so different. The mountainous part of the Rhine, with its snow cover and glaciers, makes that the runoff during the dry summer months is still substantial, whereas the runoff of the Meuse in the dry summer months is very low. But climate can be very important. Whether a river is ephemeral, intermittent or perennial depends primarily on the climate. Traditionally, we measure discharge by a current meter at a certain position in the cross-section of a river. We find the total discharge by integration of all these points over the cross-section. This is a lot of work, although it's fun, as you can see here. But although it's great fun doing it in this way, it is also a bit old-fashioned. Nowadays, we use Doppler instruments in the stream that are able to map the entire velocity field. Or we make use of movies from iPhones to infer the discharge from the flow pattern observed from the top. But this is something for an, ad for an additional course. We use discharge measurements to compose rating curves, linking the water level to the discharge. The relation between depth h and discharge q is a power function which plots a straight line on double log paper, provided we have the zero of the reading right, the so-called h0, or the gauge reading when the discharge is zero. These rating curves are expressions of the Manning formula for uniform, for uniform flow. The power function of the rating curve completely matches the Manning formula below. The Manning formula consists of two parts. The first part is a constant for the given section, and the second part depends on the water level. The width, the depth and the hydraulic radius are all dependent on the depth, whereas the roughness coefficient n and the slope s does not, in, does not vary. Interestingly, the water level dependent part purely depends on the geometry of the cross section. Stevens developed a very smart way of combining the two. The first part, the curve, one can derive from a topographical survey of the cross section. This curve can be extrapolated as far as necessary, as high as the water level may go. The other part, the line, requires a couple of discharge measurements, but because it is a straight line, it requires only a limited number of points. And subsequently, we can use that line to combine with the curve. Have a look at the example to see how it works. Rating curves can have peculiarities. On double log paper, they should plot on a straight line if you, of course, selected the right H0. But they can show kinks, inflections in the curves, which can bend up as well as down. Here you see a hand-drawn rating curve made in the 1980s of the Limpopo River in Mozambique. The dots with the years where observations during big floods, sorry, the dots indicate years with observations during big floods when the whole of the floodplain of the river was covered with water. The inflection point is at the water level where the river starts to fill the floodplain and where the floodplain offers an additional and much wider channel. This is Bangladesh, the delta of the Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna. Look at the upper east corner, called Silet. This is where world record rain is falling. 
During the monsoon, the select area is deeply flooded, up to more than four meters. You might think this is because of the heavy rainfall in the area, but it is because of the backwater from the Meghna, where it joins the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. Here you see this backwater effect. During the pre-monsoon in May, the floods in the Surma, which drain Salat, can discharge uninhibited to the Gulf of Bengal. But during the peak of the monsoon, the discharge of the Ganges and Brahmaputra is so high that it causes a great backwater. This causes rating curves to tilt upward. We see that these backwater curves are labeled as design floods with a probability of once in a hundred and once in 20 years. How do, how do we determine flood levels with these probabilities? In the chapter on precipitation, we prepared duration curves to rank the rainfall events according to their magnitude. In that way, we obtained frequency curves. For extreme floods, we shall make use of Gumbel theory for annual extremes. Here you see how a hydrograph can be turned into a duration curve, showing the percentage of time that a certain discharge is exceeded, or in this case, not exceeded. We call this the probability of non-exceedance. The interesting part of this curve is the upper part. And moreover, we would like to extrapolate the curve to rare probabilities, such as once in 100 years, a probability of non-exceedance of 99%. Gumbel developed a statistical distribution for such extremes. His statistics are useful for determining design discharges of extreme flood levels, such as these. Look at the flood marks. The basic assumption underlying Gumbel's theory is that the underlying phenomenon, in this case river flow or alternatively water levels or precipitation, are normally distributed. But this unfortunately is seldom true. Additionally, the data series needs to be homogeneous, caused by a single population of events. It should also be stationary, no climatic change or man-made changes. And it should be long enough, a reasonable part of the return period. But all these things are seldom true. Is Gumbel's theory then still useful? Well, yes, but you have to use it with good common sense. These are the equations. I'm sure they look difficult and complicated to you, but in fact they are not. They are much easier than the normal distribution, which is very similar. Gumbel's equation for Q, the probability of non-exceedance, is simpler than Gauss's equation, which we see here. Unlike the normal distribution, Gumbel's equation can be calculated easily with a pocket calculator or even with your iPhone. Moreover, the reduced variate looks similar. To carry out a Gumbel analysis, you have to select the extremes of a series. Normally, we look at annual extremes. Say you have n years of data, then you take the n highest values of these years. You then rank these extremes in order of magnitude. To determine their frequency, you use the so-called plotting position. To prevent that the lowest value in the series gets a probability of 1, you add 1 to the number of years in the denominator. As a result, the highest value in 9 years has a probability of exceedance of 1 in 10 years. Here is a table with the highest peaks over a period of 7 years. It's a short series, merely as an example. We select the seven highest values and rank them. The highest value then has the probability of exceedance of once in eight years. Gumbel paper is prepared in a way that the horizontal axis for the reduced variate y is linear. 
the Gumbel equation then plots as a straight line against the vertical ordinate. The probability of non-exceedance belonging to these y values are calculated with the Kummel formula, resulting in the typical probability pattern of the graph. The vertical ordinate is the x, which has a linear relationship with y. I'll show you an example of a Gumbel line for Thailand, where, as you can see, severe floods can take place such as in 2011, when all the banks were overtopped. I'll show you the Gumbel graph of Priya Banlu. It clearly shows that the highest value bends off when the banks overtop, just like we saw happening with the rating curve. Of course, the kink disappears if you would build a dike on both sides of the river. But what is the probability that a flood with a return period of t actually occurs within a period of n years? It's this. Try it yourself in the exercise. In applying Gumbel theory, you should always remain critical. Series are seldom normally distributed. You cannot extrapolate the theory much beyond the length of the series, and you must always be aware that series are not homogeneous. Moreover, people are always tampering with the hydrological system, and as a result, the char characteristics change over time. This was maybe not an easy part of the course, but if you study it closely, and if you practice, then it is simpler than it seems. In the next module, we'll discuss the runoff generation mechanisms.